Okay, so here are the rails. <laughs> and here is our show. Completely off. Completely gone today. What in the world? Derailed. <laughs> Yay, you're here. Welcome to the CK and GK podcast. Let's get going. Let's do it. It's Tuesday! Oh my gosh, yay! We're so glad that you're here. Welcome to CKGK. This day in history, Apollo 7 was launched, and this was the first manned Apollo mission. Um, you might know that Apollo 1 was a disaster. Um, three men died on the launch pad. So Apollo 7 was the first manned Apollo mission. Um, it was also the first TV broadcast from space. They orbited the Earth, and they um, rehearsed a lot of moon-specific tasks, like docking. But I'm really telling you this because this op uh, this it's not actually October the 10th. It's October the 11th. And if today had been the October the 10th, it would have been the perfect day to drop this episode because Caitlin, you are 10 out of 10. Oh, I love it. A little science nerd and a compliment all at the same time. My goodness. Um, I always think anytime I hear Apollo, of course, I have to cut back to Apollo 13. Right. And then you just reminded me of the it's not funny. I should not be laughing. There's that part in the beginning where the kid's like, Dad, did you know that astronauts who died in the fire? And then, you know, Tom Hanks gets very reflective and thoughtful. And uh, it's like a horrible scene of like hands hitting the window. I'm just this is this is where my brain went. But there's... welcome to our fun podcast. But it comes up <laughs> later in the movie. Because yeah, mom comes in and says something broke on your daddy's spaceship and he's not going to be able to go to the moon. And he looks right? at her. And he says it was at the was door. At the door? Yeah. yeah. Oh, man. Oh. And I don't know Awful. if Awful. that is something that they wrote just for the movie or if that is like Marilyn Lovell telling a story. But either way, it is incredible. It is an incredible story. The whole thing is incredible. I actually really, I think my favorite in that whole, my favorite part of that whole movie is um, the Jack Swagger, like, just casualness by which he becomes an astronaut, like, on that mission. And when he, like, shouts and screams that yes, he's going yes, to the moon. Yes. It's really, really cool. I love that part. There's actually a statue of Jack Swagger in the Denver airport, which I just saw last oh, time I was there. I think there's one of him um, in the Capitol building as well. Or maybe it's the same statue. Maybe it was on loan at the Capitol building and now it's in the Denver airport. Anyway. I would think that you would switch it around. I would think you would loan it to the airport and not <laughs> to, right? Probably. Like, you're, right. I don't, you're right. I don't know how that works. Anyhow. But he um, was, in case you don't know, he was elected to Congress from the state of Colorado, but, but he, he didn't get to, to serve his term. Um, mm -hmm. He died of cancer. Anyway, but, congratulations um, to Jack so, Swagger. Um, Moving we're on. We're actually here <laughs> to talk about something totally unrelated to the Apollo program. But, First, I need to introduce you because I haven't done that oh, yet. No, and I sorry. have actually been reading that there are podcasts that do not introduce their hosts. And oh. that's like confusing. There were so many times where like I would be listening to a podcast and I didn't know which one was which, right? So that's Jenny. That voice is Jenny. I'm Caitlin, but we're going to introduce Jenny. Jenny and her brother Pugsley played with an antenna in a thunderstorm before a seance, just like Wednesday Adams <laughs> did. It's October. <laughs> Um, I actually just watched some of that movie last night. Uh, a couple Amazing. years ago, we had, like, dressed like your favorite TV or movie character day, and I dressed like Wednesday. Nice. Adams. Not because she's my favorite, Did because you? it was an easy costume. Do you have a black wig? Oh, this is when my hair was brown. Oh. Okay. I used to dress like Hermione, because my hair would be, like, wild oh, and curly, yeah, and it was perfect. just a really easy one. Yeah. yeah really easy. I am also like... Or I could have done Ginny. Yeah. I'm not a... Yeah. I don't mind coloring my hair just for a costume. I've made that commitment before. <laughs> That's a level of extra that I do not achieve. Mermaid light. Okay. All right. <laughs> um, so before we get into um, the meat of today's discussion, we got to sit on the carpet. We got to have circle time. We got to tell some stories. Sit crisscross applesauce. And the first one I have to share for show and tell is the number 62. Oh, my goodness. So we Swipe. talked about Aaron Judge. 
hitting 61, tying Roger Maris's record, um, that it's not the record for most hem- home runs hit in a single season. It is the most home runs hit in a single season by someone who's not using steroids. Um, not important. But this is why I love baseball, Caitlin, because they keep stats on the weirdest stuff, right? They're like, oh, oh this yeah. is the only 87th time that someone pitching Nate Johnson has pitched to a batter also named Johnson. <laughs> like they keep that kind of stuff, right? So I know it's so weird. Okay. So here is the stat that I saw about Aaron Judge's 62 home runs this year. They have right. traveled a distance of 25,520 feet, which is almost five miles. And it is enough distance to walk from Yankee Stadium to Central Park Zoo. Oh my good lord. <laughs> Okay. All right. That's super relevant to New Yorkers. That to me is just like, all right. Okay. You know what I mean? <laughs> right. But that's it. Like somebody calculated it and then somebody also calculated found the distance that. between two landmarks in the city and how to walk it. Is it as the crow flies or is it like, that's how you have to like weave in and out of no, all of the city blocks? <laughs> oh my gosh. That's really funny. I like it. I know. I know. That makes it cooler. I'm interested in that part. All right. Well, congratulations, Aaron Judge. That's so cool. Um, Did you see that um, someone hit a home run in Toronto or something and a dog caught it? <laughs> <laughs> like someone's service dog caught it or something? Yes. <laughs> that story is butchered. I do not know where it really happened. And I don't know what kind of dog it was. But like, there's a picture of a dog that caught a home run this week. So when you're joining into random sports conversations, just say, did you guys see the picture of the dog that caught a home run? And then everyone will be like, yeah, that's amazing. And then you'll hear more about it because Jenny doesn't know the rest of the story. You didn't come here for facts, people. (laughs) Some facts sometimes, but not all the time. So We, We have said this before. We are fact adjacent. Yes, that's true. That's that could not describe me any better. Okay, so I'm going to talk about Tua. Oh, yeah. Mm. <sighs> okay, so his name is Tua Tongo Vailoa. He uh, is a quarterback for the Miami Dolphins, I believe it is. Do I have that right? Miami Dolphins? Yes, He's in the Dolphins Miami uniform. Dolphins. Yes. And um, their colors are coral and teal. I don't know if that's what they actually call them, but those are the colors. Imagine in your head, coral and teal. It's not These just like the... a straight up orange. It's kind of an orange, but it's not like orange, orange. Oh. So these are the two colors that we chose to paint our living room one year. And John and salmon. I were really proud. It's like a salmon color. Yeah. Mm. Um, and we were really excited. We got curtains that tie the paint in. We're like, this is gonna be so fun and bright. And as soon as we finished a three day weekend of painting, he looks at me and said, we just painted our living room the colors of the Miami Dolphins. <laughs> <laughs> and for the rest of the time that we had that paint in that living room, every time I would walk in, I'd be like, all right, laces mm. out, Dan, laces out. Yeah, we don't live in Miami, so this is not appropriate. Yeah, I get it. Um, Okay, so we have to talk about him because he's kind of all that anyone's talking about when it comes to the NFL right now, and for good reason. So yeah, um, I want to say two weeks ago at this point, um, he was playing in the game and took a pretty big hit um, and ended up falling backwards and hitting his head on the turf. it appeared to anyone who saw the video, which I did see, that he had a concussion. He was immediately putting his hands up near his head. Um, I don't know if you ever had a concussion, Jenny, but I have had a concussion. And it's kind of one of those things where you sort of feel like you need to shake out the cobwebs a little bit. You kind of feel a little dizzy and, and you'll see, you know, people kind of shake around and and um, and yeah, put their hands up. a car accident. Thing, yeah. And it's like you just feel it. Mm -hmm. It feels, everything feels fuzzy. Um, For me, when it happened, I also like, you know, I kind of saw stars a little bit, you know, because I hit the back of my head and then I sort of had a weird like sensory ear noise, like a ringing in my ear for a little while. And then it kind of mellowed out and, you know, I I was okay after that. Well, um, I did not, I stumbled a little bit and then I was, you know, kind of back to normal. And this was me playing soccer in high school uh, early in the season when the ground was still really hard because of ice and snow. So I know exactly how it happened and all that stuff. Well, Tua, um, something similar hits the ground, the back of his head hits the turf. 
Um, and yes, he's wearing a helmet, but you do see him like immediately instinctively put his hands up near his head. Looks like he's shaking it around. Um, and then he kind of takes a few steps, but then he clearly stumbles yeah. and a couple of players had to help hold him up. It is very clear that he is not with it in that moment. And he should have at least set out a few plays, right? Like oh, yeah. right after that, just to be looked at. Um, that did not have, should have called that immediately. Yeah, exactly. It, it, yeah. Um, and because the play was over, they were sort of like, oh, let's watch and see what happens. And then he just kept right on going. Right. So um, at the end of the game, you know, he's he's talking to the press and he says, it kind of felt like I hyperextended my back. And that's the narrative that the team went with was it was a back injury. Well, four days later on Thursday, the Miami Dolphins are playing again and Tua is in, should not have been in. You have a concussion or what appears to be a concussion. You are supposed to protect the player. You should not have put him in regardless of your desire to win. That's my opinion. Anyway, he goes in, he takes another hit and it's the same kind of thing. And this time when he goes down, there's no coming back up and his hands it was very frightening. His hands did what's called a fencing response, where his hands sort of look splayed and fingers are locked. And I don't know if you can see what I'm doing, but like, it's very much rigid fingers in a very strange position. Um, I've only it's, ever seen it one time really? in real life. And it's when I was lifeguarding and another girl who was also lifeguarding was severely dehydrated, passed out and hit her head on the pool deck. Oh, how scary. Yeah. Oh, how scary. Um, so it's a very frightening thing to see with hands. Um, and, you know, I, I believe my husband was the one who said it kind of looked like he dislocated his fingers or something. Like there was some sort of finger injury um, because they were in very odd, rigid positions. And then looking at it later, um, several doctors were like, no, 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 that's a, that's a fencing response. And it's kind of indicative of something potentially ha having happened to the brainstem or motor cortex or something like that. It, it, it typically uh, indicates that sort of injury. It's a little bit scary. Uh, we, we know he's in recovery right now. Um, they did fire the doctor who initially said that he was okay to return to play. Um this was an uh, NFL players union doctor, so not a team doctor, um, but a players union doctor. And again, Tua, is, who also said, you know, I felt like I hyperextended my back, but we don't know if that's his narrative. We don't know if that's the team narrative or the doctor narrative. We don't know any of those reasons why he would have said that. It clearly was not a back injury. You don't have a back injury, shake your head around like that, and then you know, stumble around in that manner. I've had a back injury and it doesn't look like that. So um, it's kind of reignited this debate about um, concussion protocols, uh, player safety. Um, and one of the interesting things that I heard was um, people discussing the quick turnaround on player time, the time between games. Um, right. Sunday Thursday, Thursday night, not far. no Thursday night football, while it might be good for the NFL and money, it's not good for players. And that was really the, the big debate that, uh, raged on us alongside this concussion protocol thing. So I'm wondering if more heads are going to roll, you know, so to speak, um, in terms of who's else is going to get fired. If anyone, uh, I do hope that to, uh, improves quickly a head injury and then a second head injury on top of that you you can risk all kinds of permanent brain damage he's going to be dealing with the consequences of this for a while and for whatever reason the choice to put him in was not a good one so um that's a that's an nfl update and uh hopefully that gives you a little yeah. bit of the gist of what's happening there good news something exciting to talk about i have talked about this on the show before but I am okay. currently obsessed with HelloFresh again. <laughs> we are seeking you, sponsors. Like, that, that, yeah. Mm -hmm. You guys want to partner with me? And I actually looked into it, Caitlin. This is really funny. Oh, I love it. At the bottom of their website, they have like a little link that you can click if you're an um, influencer and you want to advertise with them. <laughs> oh my gosh. And it's not fancy. It's a Google form that you oh, fill perf. out. Did you fill and it out? Like, oh, no. Because one of the things is 
how many followers do you have on your social media? And it's like, one of the options is a million plus. Ew. <laughs> and I was like, uh, 200? Like, <laughs> no, we have more than that. Well, no, I don't, I can't speak for the pod, but like for me as a person, like if I was going to be the person filling this out, this box that we got this week had five dishes in it. Um, it had a chicken with a mushroom sauce. Very good. And it came with barley. Who mm. knew barley was good? Yeah, I like barley. I have never made barley. You just boil it. Mm-hmm. You just boil it. You it's easier than it. quinoa. Yeah, you just put it in water and boil it. Yeah, and you it's easy. It. Mm-hmm. it was very good. There was a salmon dish, and actually we got two servings of the salmon dish because it sounded so good, with a lemon cream sauce. Oh, my God. Yum. So great, with mm. um, zucchini and tomatoes. Caitlin, I made this food. Right? Like I made You made this. the food by yourself? I made it. Oh yeah. my goodness. And like the salmon is seared and crispy like a restaurant. And I feel so fancy because I made it. I mean, all I did was follow directions, but still, it's so good. Even the meatloaf was good. And when I saw meatloaf was one of our meals, I turned my nose up at it and I looked at John. And I'm like, why do we have meatloaf as one meatloaf. of our options? I made it tonight. I wanted to eat two of them mm, good for I, you I, I fought myself on packing it for my lunch or eating it tonight meatloaf meatloaf, meatloaf. I... and roasted broccoli and i was like <laughs> man this meal is good you know what i actually really like roasted broccoli uh olive oil um lemon pepper garlic salt yum and just throw it in the yeah just throw it in yeah. the oven oh and it's all crispy and like like a chip it was kinda. delicious. Yeah, it's it so delicious. good. <laughs> and we are, um, we have cut out carbs right now. Mm. Like normally we're like lowish carb and like trying to count them, but we have gone to zero carbs unless they come in a pint glass okay. on Saturday or Sunday. Okay, right? that's different. Yeah, that's not the same thing. I didn't even miss them tonight. I was like, this meatloaf, and it it came with a, a gravy that I didn't make because gravy is basically just fat and flour, but. It was good. It didn't even need it. That's amazing. I'm I'm into barley. it. Barley. 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 And barley, wait, bar, barley's not a carb? I'm confused. Is barley a carb? I, oh my it God, has to be. It's a, a grain. Is butter a carb? Butter is a necessary piece of every bit of cooking that you do. Barley is a carb. Barley is a carb. <laughs> That's why Maybe you liked it so much. Because <laughs> you haven't had a carb in so long. Meanwhile, everyone else on the planet's like, yeah, barley, it's not that great. And I'm like, no, I actually anymore. like barley. I like it. I think it's great. That's really funny. How did you not know barley was a carb, girl? <laughs> I thought since it was like whole grain, like maybe it's fine. I don't understand. Whole I, grain. I'm a science teacher. Wait, what? We're over here trying to may, teach people may things. I just apologize to the twelve years of students I taught biology, and I cannot recognize what a carbohydrate is. Barley is a carb. <laughs> okay, so I thought the name of this episode should be "Exchanging Baseball Pleasantries" because at one point Cappy says that in this interview that we're going to listen to. But no, barley is a carb has to be the name. <laughs> Or is barley a carb? <laughs> is barley a carb? <laughs> oh, my word. That's so funny. Also, by the way, <laughs> you can put that we have at least 2,400 followers in our social media combined. We have at, okay. at least. That's just Instagram and Twitter. <laughs> All right. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to hit up Paula Fresh then and tell we them 2,400. We have 1,745 probably... on, on Twitter. A lot. <laughs> Barley should be avoided on keto or other low carb diets because it is very high in net carbs, says the science teacher who is keto. Uh, no. no. Oh, Apparently not tonight. Um, it's okay. You had a lot of protein in that am, meatloaf. You're yeah, good. I am a medium carb. I thought I was no carb, but uh... I did an ADHD thing. Okay, we talked about this before. ADHD people, when they're not medicated, they thrive on three things. I don't know what the third one is, but I know that one of them is projects, right? And patterns. And I don't... And patterns, right. 
Um, here's what happened. I was in my bathroom cabinet, which we've talked about before. It's a very large cabinet, but it doesn't have like um, those like pull out racks where you can kind of slide all your stuff out and mm-hmm. see everything, which is a little annoying. So um, they're very deep, far back, but I can't get to everything I need and it's annoying. So I completely lost my mind and decided that I needed acrylic organizer bins to put things in so that I could at least see where everything is. Right, right, and, right. and yeah, so I spent like $150 on acrylic organizing <laughs> One of them, I was like, I need this right now. And I ordered it on like a Saturday morning and it was there four hours later. Because that, that was how bad this this binge of purchasing was. So um, it's fine. I, I That was my project, right? I put it together. I, I rearranged the things in my bathroom cabinet. So now... I can see everything and I keep forgetting where certain things are because I've moved them. And so now my like, you know, uh, muscle memory is all jacked up and I keep reaching for the wrong thing. So I'm not getting my toothbrush right away, but that's okay. It's fine because it looks the way I want it to, at least for now, as much as it possibly can. So that's the first thing that I'm obsessed with. But also this one is a little bit nicer and it might be helpful for some parents who have um, sassy children. Do you know any of those children that are sassy? Because, hmm. yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mine is sassy. So um, I am home watching Bravo, as you do, because right. I love it. And um, I'm watching Southern Charm. And I hope that someone is out there going, oh, my gosh, I love Southern Charm, too. Anyway, um, there's a character, not character. She's a person. She's a real person because it's a reality TV show. Reality in air quotes. And her name is Leva, and Leva says something to the effect of, in our house, we're big on using kind words with each other, and I say, talk to me like you love me, to her children when they're being sassy. And I was like, oh my gosh, I love that. So um, we're real big on that. You know, um, my son has five things, five like general rules, affirmations that we talk about every day. And um, we always talk about, you know, um, being nice to people, trying. Um, if you have to go to the bathroom, stop and go right away. We use the Daniel Tiger line, right? If you have to go potty, stop and go right away. So he has to do that. He has to listen to his teachers. You just sang on the show. I know. It's been a while. I used to sing all the time, but I just, I yeah. Um, and then there's one other one that, of course, is escaping me right now. But anyway, the be nice to everyone is like... Is sort of our way of saying just lead with kindness, right? Like even when people are not nice, which we're seeing more of happening this year because first grade and because he's on the bus and there's, you know, he thinks he's an older kid, but really, you know, the older kids think he's a little kid and all those things. So we're seeing that more. And so we're just saying, you know, lead with kindness. Well, that hasn't been working at home necessarily because my child is a little um, opinionated and sassy and tenacious. So, um, when he's been getting sassy and he's talking to me in a very uh, rude, shall I say, tone where he's super mm. frustrated and I'm getting hollered at, even though I'm just like, I just wanted to know if you wanted a snack. Like I and and I've done the thing where I like he's distracted. So I make contact. I touch his knee or I touch his hand and I say, Sam, I'm talking to you. And then right. he snaps at me. I'll say, hold on. Oh, yeah. Hold on. I'm just asking a question. Talk to me like you love me. And then I love it. Proceed. Now, of course, today, here's this is leading me right into my gym, right? Today, I say that to him. Talk to me like you love me. I'm just trying to help you with your homework. Homework is all done. All he had to do was write the date. I didn't know how his teacher asked for the date. He he was mad at the way that we were explaining it. So whatever, (laughs) whatever. (laughs) And I went, talk to me like you love me. And he goes, no. And I'm like, oh, okay, great. You can go talk to someone else with that rude tone in your room by yourself. You're not going to talk to me that way. And instead he's like, I'm not going to my room. And I was like, I, this is when I shut down. Like, I'm not going to honor your response. You're either going to straighten up or you're going to go to your room. That's it. 
Right. So he, <laughs> I said, okay, well, when you feel ready, you can come talk to me. I don't need to be around this. And I like proceed to move, remove myself from the situation. I don't need to be around someone who's not going to talk to me kindly. So what does he do? He gets right up in my face, right up in my face. And when I tell you that if it had been me at age 14 and another 14 year old girl had done the same thing, I probably would have decked her. Um, but this is my child and I know that I need to be controlled. And I just went like, <clears throat> I just, that's all I did. I just cleared my throat and I moved away. And then he went over and got his pencil and finished his homework up. And it was like an immediate change of tone. Like after he tested me and I didn't react, it was an immediate change of tone. But then I, I said later, like, you were not talking to me like you love me. I did not appreciate that. And he, and he was like apologetic and understood. And so that's going to be my default line now. Talk to me like that's you love awesome. me. Hopefully it works like for that. someone else. <laughs> that's my drama, but that's, that's my gem. Is me not losing my ever loving mind when my child got super sassy. <sighs> oh my gosh. Okay. So my gem also comes out of my child's mouth. Okay. Um, we saw a car that was being towed on a trailer and it was obviously like someone's antique car. Okay. And um, Abby, who is 10, almost 11, um, says, oh, is that a fancy car? And John says, no, I think it's, it needs some work. It's probably not worth that much. And she goes, oh, well, what do you think is the most expensive car? No, oh, good question. And he says, well, I bet there's cars out there that probably cost like a million bucks or something. And she goes, oh, is it like fancy and has a toilet? <laughs> <laughs> so immediately I'm like, oh, my gosh, this child needs to be exposed to exhibit and get my ride. Because people will be putting like fish tanks and Xboxes in their cars when really to make it fancy for Abigail, all you gotta do is put, a, put a toilet in, the back. in it. Oh my goodness. Oh. I mean, everyone wants to be able to do their business in the lap of luxury, right? So I right. totally understand. So, like, what makes a car fancy? Whether or not it's got a pooper, it, a padded one. It has to be a padded, John, right? nice so <laughs> oh my gosh oh lord okay well okay so before we break mm -hmm. um i want to talk a little bit about what our listeners are about to hear so okay they're gonna get a promo and then snippets and snappets from a broadcast talk to us about that snippets and snappets we've had my father-in-law my caps on the show before talking baseball. So if you haven't heard that episode, go back and listen. Um, Cappy is the play by play caller, the voice of the round rock express, which is the AAA team here uh, in Austin for it's not technically Austin. It's round rock. They are the minor league team, minor league baseball team that we have in town. And he's been the voice of the express for, Years and years and years. I think he's called now 3,500 games, which is amazing. So crazy. Amazing. I pitched this idea to him a while back saying, you know, I think that part of the reason that there are uh, people who don't watch baseball or enjoy baseball is because they don't understand baseball, right? Like it's so much easier to enjoy something when you actually understand what's happening which is sort of the whole premise behind our sports episodes in the first place, right? Like we want you to right. be able to understand what's happening, understand the vocabulary, and then, you know, you can, you can enjoy at your own level. <laughs> you just don't have to hate it, right? You can at least understand something. Right. So um, the idea was if I go on the radio broadcast with you as you are calling a game then maybe I could ask some questions about things that I don't understand and you can help me answer them. And perhaps listeners might enjoy that. So Cappy made it happen. I had a press pass, which was like the coolest thing I've ever You're had. So I've fancy. never had a press pass before. It was a really good time. I got to go and uh, ask questions during the game. So as Cappy is play calling and Matt Kata is doing color, I get to 
interject and ask questions and get some stories from Cappy. So I, we thought it would be a really cool thing for you guys to get to hear not only uh, the work that he does, but the answers to those baseball questions. We've got playoffs coming up pretty soon. So uh, it's relevant. It's topical now. And, and hopefully it helps you have another level of understanding and appreciation for the game of baseball. While Caitlin is doing the broadcast, I was at a party and I had one earbud in <laughs> and I'm like so good. listening to her broadcast at this party and like also trying to like text her and say, oh my gosh, I heard your question. It's so great. Or, yeah. Oh, wow. What a play. Yeah. She's and like feeding I'm me like questions too. Party, she had some good ones. The, I, I was like, um, like a super spy or something. <laughs> trying to adjust my hair so She's that... Like, it's not obvious that I'm not paying attention to the party at all and listening to a baseball broadcast. She's like off in the corner eating the guacamole with her finger over her yeah. ear. Like, <laughs> <laughs> that's what I do regularly. What does it really take to make it in baseball? Forget the fame and the fortune. It takes grit, it takes perseverance, it takes the ability to grind it out. Mike Capps and Chuck Hartenstein know all about the grind. They've watched it. They've lived it. And now they've chronicled it. Grinders, baseball's intrepid infantry, tells the story of the journeyman, the unheralded, the overlooked, the players whose sheer love of the game keeps them going. They make the game what it is, and they make the stars possible. Grinders is their story. Hear the players themselves tell what life is like in the grind and what they're willing to do for that one shot at the show. Available in early July, wherever books are sold. Pre-order Grinders now at stonycreekpublishing.com. And be sure to check out our other books, audiobooks, and podcasts. Stony Creek Publishing. We tell the stories you've been waiting to hear. Uh, it should be laugh a lot. Should be the name of the podcast, and not CK and GK. Here's the first pitch to Max Schumann. I'm already, I'm sweating. It's I know it's hot out here, but I'm a little. I've, I haven't I haven't prepped or screened any of these questions, so I'm a little. I'm a little nervous. No. Well, the thing that we talk about the most on the show when it comes to learning something new is just knowing the vocabulary of whatever mm. it is we're watching. So. To me, any of the stuff that you can explain, what the word actually means, is going to give people access. How do you know what's coming across the plate from here? 0-2 pitch. Bounce right into second base. And on to first, got him very quickly here, two out. Yeah, I mean, a lot of it's obviously just watching a lot of baseball. Mm -hmm. But knowing that a fastball is going to be a little faster, straighter, a curveball. Up here, you know, we don't have the best view, but you can see... A little bit of that spin, you can see kind of how it comes in and curves. I think change-ups are the tough one because a change-up is supposed to look like a fastball, but it's obviously a little slower. Hmm. Christian Pache looks at one high and wide, ball one. No score, we're playing in the top half of the third. You're listening to my daughter-in-law, Caitlin Kindred, and Matt Cata exchange baseball pleasantries. Here's the one over to wide. And the- you know, you can see up there the, the speed, so 81 you know his fastball is 90 plus and that's you know that's a change up mm, okay that makes sense yeah so that helps yeah absolutely one one to Pache. that's down and in so perfect example right there that pitch is 93 his change up was 81 which is you know that's what you want that differential in the velocity to be other terminology things like down and in that can vary depending on which side the batter correct. is on correct correct absolutely correct mm-hmm. but i like how you started off with this question of understanding because you know nothing cooler than someone who can talk the game or you can go to you know whether it's a a date or even just sitting and watching a ball game knowing what's going on middle of the third from Dell diamond still no score round rock and las vegas this is round rock express baseball on am 1300 the zone Mrs. Kindred, take over, please. I'm just, so I'm just thinking about the positions of these players right now, and I'm looking and noticing that most of your hitters are right-handers, and so is that the reason why this side of the field, which you're going to correct me on in just a second here, because uh, I'm sounding like a noob, is that why there's a shortstop over there as opposed to having one in between first and second also? Or yeah, no? okay. yeah. I think it <laughs> kind of has your first base, second base, third base. Right. Um, First pitch to Bubba Thompson. Breaking ball foul back, strike one. 
But, you know, with, with we haven't seen very many shifts. Not tonight. Tonight, haven't. but sometimes you'll see them all loaded on one side of the field because they're using all the data that they have saying, oh, one pitch up and away. You know, pretty good chance this guy's going to hit a ball to the left of second base. But that's a uh, an interesting discussion, analytics and data being infused a lot more into the game. There's people that love it, people that do not so much. Down and away. Because they feel like it's taken an element, hmm. you know, out of the game feel. But it's, you know, it's data. It's a tough game. And, and anything you can use to, you know, get some sort of competitive advantage is, is really what they're looking for. Okay, so speaking of data, let's hear it. Are you guys data people? In certain instances, I certainly am. I like a lot of what happens uh, with, with analytics and the way they use them. Yeah, I think it's, um, it's a part of how you sort of orchestrate yeah. and, and work a game. As a manager, you know, you're, you're having to make, you know, various decisions. And as a hitter, you know, if you know, okay, this guy does this and this in certain situations. That's foul. Back one strike on Martinez. You know, it makes something that is really hard to do, you know. I mean, hitting 300 is you're failing seven out of ten times. So I think that's as someone who's just getting introduced to the game and they're watching this, this thing right here, right, hitting is really, really hard. Right. A hit, what is a hit? What's an error? I mean, obviously in the Little League, you know, oh, my son got a home run. But it was like, no, that was an error, and they threw it <laughs> over there, and he kept running, and he got to home, but that's not a home run. I think also a barrier to a lot of people understanding this game is numbers, right? These numbers all mean different things, and these they're all said differently. Yeah, good point. I, I think it's on maybe MLB.com or Major League Baseball's website where there's a tab and it's literally like baseball lingo oh, yeah. and it goes a to z and and it's a long list so you're right one two pitch drops down and in very tight at that back foot two and two absolutely i mean we've done it we've done a show on baseball vocabulary and it was one of our longer ones because it there is so much to know in order to understand what appears to be a very simple game swung on and missed strike three and the 45th stolen base for Bubba Thompson. He is the new all-time Round Rock Express stolen base record holder. And he gets this round of applause from the fans as he was taking a lot of grief in the clubhouse for that today. But uh, he sort of said, uh, don't worry, there'll be more than 45. Headed to the floor of last dates in baseball history. Caitlin will continue her uh, examination of <laughs> baseball with Matt Cater when we come back. Scoreless at Dell Diamond. And uh, we continue with the interview with Caitlin, my daughter in law, and Mr. Cater as Matt Davidson looks at one wide, ball one. Okay, so I, I heard you guys earlier talking about shadows. Right now, it seems to be moved much further down. Tell me about what the issue is here. Well, as you can see, it's foul back strike one. Cole, Reagan's. There's some light on him, and then the darkness, and so that visual, you know, plays with the eyes. It's science. It's science. Um, but it definitely <laughs> creates uh, one one up and in. It, it creates a challenging visual. Um, so your next inning is when it'll all kind of be in the shadows. That'll be a, it'll be a lot easier to to recognize the pitches. So you're talking all those pitches before two one broken bat, number out in the left and a dive by Martinez and he got it. What a play by J B Martinez! If you think speed does not kill in the outfield, you just saw it there. That was cool. Yeah, sweet play right there. Mm -hmm. So sawed off. Jam shot. So that basically means on a bat, you know, there's an area of the bat where it's the hardest. They call it the sweet spot. That ball definitely was closer towards his hands and, mm. and broke. So it was a big swing, but it didn't go anywhere. So JP, you kind of saw him hesitate for a little bit because he didn't quite know, is it going to be over my head? And then, you know, having that speed, he was able to kind of burst and make that dive and play. And then now... As you can see, now we have that shift, right? Mm -hmm. We have 
Yeah, third Three base guys. comes all the way out. Yep. Yeah. Very different. 2-2. Two, two. Breaking ball a little bit low. Well, a whole bunch low if you look at the grid. And really, Cappy, who was it? Was it, uh, I think it was probably Lou Boudreau, manager, was kind of the first one to really Ted shift. Williams. Ted Williams. Yep. That was the in the year. I'm trying to think if that was 46 or 47 or 48. One of those yeah. three years. Anyway, long story short, Williams said, to heck with it. I'm going to beat that ship by hitting into it. And finally, yeah, he, he bunted, and it <laughs> made big headlines in the Boston papers. Ted Bunts. One of the greatest hitters, if not the greatest of all time, Ted Williams bonded. That's it, right back up the middle. Shortstop Doro behind the second base bag. You know, how is this different? How is calling a AAA game different from calling at a different level? 1-1 one, one pitch, bounce foul up the first base. Jeez, I don't know if that's a question for me. That's one for me. Cappy. All right. Um, well, I'll, I, let me just say this. Um, AAA ball is pretty fast. Hmm. And... That said, there's a marked difference, and I guess I've called 30 major league games by now, filling in for the Rangers, filling in on ESPN Radio, and for the Astros. That's upstairs, three balls, two strikes. Not so much marked difference in just the speed of the game, but the ability of pitchers to pitch. That's driven into left center field. Has a lot of air under it. Over comes the left fielder. That's Barrera to put it away. One gone now as Abanias flies to left. The pitcher's ability to spot up in terms of hitting their spots at 95, 96. You don't see that much here. They're refining their talent. So that's 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 the quickness to me. Now, Matt can tell you the difference in playing sure. at the AAA level than the big league level. Yeah, and... You know, I think consistency is the biggest thing. These guys are still kind of in the development phase. Inside corner, strike one to Sam Huff. You know, of their careers, or or you see some guys who have played and they're kind of trying to get back. So it's an interesting mix because you do have some. That's downstairs. You know, you do have some guys who've been to the big leagues or, right, as, as you know, Adrian, is, you know, he's got he's been there this year already. So certainly got the potential and stuff. Sam Huff looks at strike two, and Sam Huff's been up and down between the Rangers yeah. and Round Rock four different times. Mm -hmm. So, I mean, I think it's just the overall consistency is, is, I think, the biggest difference. Would you say that it's less consistent here? One-two pitch, banged into right field. That'll drop for a base hit. It certainly didn't go 500 feet, but it's a base hit for Huff. Cer certainly it's less consistent here. I mean, is it less consistent than at a, a lower level, a double-A ball, do you think? Yeah, for, yes, absolutely. Okay. As, as you go lower, you're, you know, you're seeing a lot of guys who, yeah, just don't, haven't quite polished mm -hmm. whatever it is at the plate, on the mound with their, with their pitches. And so, but that is the great part about, like, double-A, triple-A. If you're coming to a game... Just as a fan, yes, you're coming to the Express here at Dell Diamond because the whole thing is just awesome, right? Everything in between, the food, this and that. But when you look on the field, I mean, these are these are guys who are just on the, the cusp of, you know, watching them on TV. That's a bunt foul up the third base side. Of the least likely to bunt, tried it, and almost pulled it off, Soleil. Two strikes, one out, still no score. Dandy pitcher's battle, one hit for Vegas. Three for the Round Rock Express. There's so many questions about strategy in terms of a lineup. Um, obviously, position players are in places for a reason. What is the strategy in a lineup? First pitch to Arias on the way. Breaking ball settles in for a strike. I think that's a great question. I think what you, every manager is a little different, every team in, in their philosophy, but this is definitely how data has that's foul back to the screen. Strike. Has, has maybe changed the typical, okay, the leadoff guy is the guy with speed. Bubba Thompson just mm. broke the stolen base record. The next guy, you love a left-handed guy because when Bubba's on first, as we see right here, look at that whole area. The first mm -hmm. baseman has to cover, and now there's that whole area. So if you're lefty, you can kind of just roll over the ball and you, know, and you can kind of get a hit. So oh, typically you like the guy – who's hitting second to be able to really be able to kind of control the bat, maybe bunt, 
hook the ball over there. Plus, you also have a natural baffle for a catcher trying to make a throw to second base with that left-handed yep, batter standing exactly. in, the, in that box on the right side of the field. One-two pitch. Rolled out towards short. Easy scoop. Throw to second. Done. Round Rock's done in what turns out to be a scoreless fourth inning. No runs. One hit. One left. Okay, so that was the first third of the, of the rotation, right, of the roster. Tell me more about the middle. Yeah, so then a one pitch to Smith. Swing and a miss on a change. Now you get the middle of the lineup, the heart of the order, right, which is typically your three, four, five hitters are, you know, your best hitters. So if there's runners in scoring positions, there's, you know, they can, they can do a lot. Next pitch, cut on and miss. They are not seeing him well at all. He gets away from the catcher, and Watley throws a strike to first. Kevin Smith retired for Drew Jackson, the shortstop. Right, hit for average, hit for power. Hmm. Uh, so that's that's definitely where you're seeing probably your better you know, your better hitters. And then again, it just I guess it just depends on you know the team. Certainly, there's some teams in the big leagues right now that one through nine. There really isn't a, uh, an easy out. A lot of tough ABs. So as a pitcher, for sure, you kind of they're going down and you know they're looking at averages and different things. First pitch, way outside to Drew Jackson, ball one. Well, certainly. And then they're, oh, sorry, they're, go ahead. Well, and then they're they're checking accounts too in the big leagues. Like that, that probably is a little different than the guys at the bottom of the order. One over to Jackson, ripping a miss. I mean that makes sense if you're trying to if you're trying to put your best hitters in the middle you're hoping that that's because the the guys before him are already on base so you're hoping like that's part of the strategy that makes a lot of sense to me one for one. sure sales inside two and one to jackson and then over a course of a game they're obviously getting maybe one more at bat they're going to come up to mm -hmm. the plate more than the guys at the bottom of the order so that makes sense yeah. right back comes reagan swing and a miss strike two but, I mean, is it the Yankees who Aaron Judge at one point was hitting in the two-hole? Yes. Uh, there's a So the, the data, the analytics have said, well, we want the two-hole guy to be more of a power guy. or 2-2 two -two pitch. Ooh. Spot the computer of, missed uh, that one. Yeah, a lot of crazy things. Uh, a guy that in 2011, Cappy mentioned, um, that was when Duran, who had the stolen base record, Swing and a miss, strike three. But there was a guy on the team, one of my good friends, Kevin Cash. He's now the manager for the Tampa Bay Rays. And they do some really kind of crazy type of, you know, things with their with their lineup and, you know, where guys are hitting. So, yeah, I think every every team and every manager is a little, a little different. So when I was teaching uh, back in Colorado, we had the opportunity to take our students to a Rockies game. Nice. Um, and one of the things that we did, because our kids were new to baseball. 2-1. That's foul back. Was. Uh, it's down in the seats now. Yeah, it is. One of the things we did was actually show them how to score a game on a piece of paper. Yes. Excellent. It was very cool. And I also told my kids. If you turn it into me and it's you've gotten through three innings, I'll give you some extra credit for that one. Wow. But, you know, <laughs> here's here's what you just did when you did that. Here's the 2-2 pitch. Swing and a miss on a chain strike three. Got him. That's the fifth punch out for Martinez. Two gone now here in the fifth inning for J.P. Martinez, who walked and stole a base his first time up in AAA. What you did, if you gave the game forever to one kid doing that, that's a victory in and of itself because that kid's going to tell another kid how cool that is. And that's the way you spread the word about this game. And there's so many other things for kids to do today besides baseball, soccer, and video games and whatnot. Here's the pitch to Martinez. It's there for a strike. A snap throw back to first, not in time. Well, and it's one of those things, if you're here at the game, you know, you kind of, we got the best view up here because we kind of get to look down and. A lot of people are on their phones, and yep. when you're keeping score, you got to watch and pay attention to the game. Ryan steals second here. you got to make a little note and dictate he's on second now. Martinez so. pitch just misses inside, takes the count to two and nothing. I mean, there's a lot you can teach that applies to other topics, too, when it comes to baseball. We oh, were using course. it to make calculations with oh, ratios. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh, for sure. I never did learn that. Here's the 1-1. One, one. 
That's a high drive into short right field. Wind has it. Right fielder McKinney comes over, makes the adjustment for the wind, and puts it away, and Round Rock's done in a scoreless fifth inning. No runs, one hit, one left. We're headed to the sixth here at Dell Diamond. Still no score in a dandy pitcher's battle, Round Rock and Vegas. So you're talking strategy before. This is a great uh, this is a great example of a strategy where your first base is open, nobody's on first base. Uh, a proven hitter. I mean, you look at his numbers, 285, 16 homers. He's already hit a ball, a couple of balls, you know, uh, pretty hard. And so now it's, I don't know if it's exactly what they're on the mound talking about, but they're certainly, oh, I don't want to give maybe this guy something great to, to hit because then you have, you know, when you look at a lineup, now you have the guy on deck who he's left-handed. So lefty on lefty, that's a lot more challenging. So those are the things that I think, yeah, unless you're not really paying attention and understanding. So you might be the fan that's like, oh, how come you just walked him right here? And oh, boo, you know. <laughs> Three, two pitch. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, right? You could but, go, but in you the could end, go next door and yeah, be with those guys. That's right. <laughs> Talking like that. <laughs> come on, two Crazy. strikes, buddy. Come, come on, man. <laughs> yeah. um, but it is, you know, it is a good little thing to know and understand, especially going into that bat at the start of the bat. Ooh, watch here. You know, if your dad and son, hey, look how he's going to pitch him tough here. He's not just going to throw him fastballs over the middle of the plate. So you're going to be a hero on your podcast, aren't you? Oh, am I? I we'll see. <laughs> we'll see. <laughs> well, you get to edit it. I, I do get to do that. That is one of the beautiful parts of podcasting. Huh. Oh, so many times in my life in this business, baseball or otherwise, I really wish I could have edited a lot of stuff. Here's the pitch. <laughs> Al back again. You don't see many pitchers' battles in this league, especially when the wind blows out here in Round Rock. But this has been a dandy. Adrian Martinez. As I said, we, we do talk about gems. What are our ridiculous things that happen? So I'm curious about, from either one of you, what is your either baseball gem something ridiculous that just made you laugh can be this season can be any game you've seen i want to know what the funnies are mm. Mm. Uh, the, for me the 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 thing that is kind of everyone maybe will remember i was playing second base when randy johnson hit that bird oh. yeah <laughs> Poor bird that's foul yeah. back strike one by walker so you know, that's something that someone has either seen or heard about, or if you haven't, definitely look it up. Um, Did you unfortunately catch the birdie? No, that birdie. Um, they went to be with yeah, the Lord, right? quick. No yeah. balls in one strike. Three to the right side. That slides inside. Now, not Even funny, maybe one weird. One. Sure. <laughs> um, sure. That's but a it was weird where, yeah, all of a sudden there's this big cloud of feathers and everyone paused, like, Ooh. what just happened? And then... <laughs> You know, there was a cleanup on aisle three, all the, <laughs> all that kind of stuff. But it was definitely, you don't see that every day. Mm -mm. Clean up in left center. Here's the 1-1, one, one, down and in. Two balls, one strike. Well, the funniest thing that's ever happened in this booth, Jackson Ryan, who's now 21 years old, was nine. And we had a pizza sponsor that was a big-time sponsor. And this is written in my new book called Grinders, which you have a copy of here. Mm -hmm. And Jackson... We were doing the, the scoreboard updates. We're brought to you by this pizza company. That's bounced into right field base end. That should score Abanez. He's going to have to turn on the Jets. Steele Walker drives in the first run, and Round Rock leads it one and up. Steele Walker has been hot. <coughs> A double and an RBI single, and Round Rock's on the board. One nothing. Great at bat there by Steele. Seeing I single, just got it through the right side. Banya's had a nice jump at second. Sam Huff has a single in two times. Will you please hit a home run so I won't have to listen to Kata anymore about this, dear sweet Lord? Here's the pitch. That's upstairs, ball one. But anyway, scoreboard updates brought to you by blah, 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 pizza. It's Round Rock Express official pizza and the favorite of Jackson Ryan. Nope. Nope, 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 nope. Little did Jackson know. 1 0 pitch. Right there, a little bit low. Two balls, no strikes. That is bad. His mom 
his grandfather, Nolan, and his grandmother, Ruth, were seated in that booth right next door, and they could hear the whole thing. And the next thing you heard was Reed Ryan. Jackson Ryan! <laughs> Jackson is in is in a chair about this high, takes off his headset, and says, I think I'll see you tomorrow. I have to go. Goodbye. <laughs> I just got grounded. <laughs> so for, for, and you could hear Reed on the way out. It may not be your favorite pizza, and there may not be a location nearest to you, but it just became your favorite pizza, young man. <laughs> Jackson still scalded by that, and every time he runs into somebody that knows me, somebody says something about it. What else you have, Ms. Kindred? Well, I mean, I'm just thinking about talking about the action and how there are plenty of people who don't necessarily appreciate how hard this is. You're trying to... <laughs> this is a hard yeah. game. 2 0 pitch upstairs, three balls, no strikes. And I mean, I've heard it over and over again from you know my husband who says you're trying to hit a ball, a round ball with a round bat, and that ball's coming at you at 90, 95 miles an hour. 3 0 pitch. That's over for a strike. And I mean, still, it's it's sometimes difficult for people to um, not necessarily just understand, but just. That's loud. There's a train. That's the train. That is <laughs> a train. Big train. <laughs> Big long train. 3 1 pitch drilled into right field, a base hit. So Arias with another multiple hit game, a leadoff single against Lemoyne. Seven hits now for Round Rock as we open the bottom of the seven. So if you're somebody who is trying to do as you say and, and listen to more baseball, what do I need to know to in order to enjoy a radio broadcast over watching a game on tv Ooh, you want to give you that was a big lob shot that i get to take a shot at thanks gk <laughs> <laughs> double play depth infield as doro squared to butt let it go by for a ball really well, good mean, really good play-by-play -play guys are very very descriptive uh, you want to see, and, and I'm going to say this, my buddy Bill Mercer, who's 96, who basically taught me this, received a letter one time when he was, that's ah, down a bit, 2-0, and o, was doing minor league ball right before, the year before the Rangers came to Arlington, and he became the Rangers' original announcer. And he said, the, the letter said something along the lines of, I depend on your play-by-play -play every single night. That's up and in, three and nothing. Because, first of all, in my mind's eye, I can see it. Mm. Secondly, I'm blind. Well. <laughs> and, well, it, it, that, and you need that, made, you that need made Bill cry. Yeah. Because the thought that someone mm. who couldn't see was so locked in, mm. that's over for a strike, is so important. And I, I think about that every day when I step in here. Describe, describe, describe. You can't describe too much. Nowadays, you hear guys on radio basically calling balls and strikes. Well, that's boring. Here's the 3-1. That's down and away. Ball four, lost him. So a single and a walk given up by Des Moines, and that'll bring up Matt Watley, who's over two. So that's what I'm saying. It's, it, it, if you tune it in and all you're hearing is balls and strikes called, go back to the television. Okay. That's legit. I understand that. I think it also makes it challenging. Well, I know, what, eight, the first time I ever was brought up in the booth here and, and you know, you've heard the Vin Scullys and growing up in yep. Cleveland, um, you know, Tom Hamilton was yep. great. And, and, you know, the times when you would listen to the radio in the car, really mainly in the car because, you know, you had it on TV growing up. But there is a... There's a style, and there's you can't just talk. And even if, as he told you, like, hey, before we get on here, you know, <laughs> there's people listening, and we gotta we gotta tell them what's going on. Mm -hmm. um, I know that was for me, especially when you kind of have that little bit of time, and you want to tell a story, and you want to get into it. You know, there's that give and take of letting the action happen, and then kind of keeping it going. So it's uh, the good ones, and obviously, I'm I'm fortunate to you know be next to this guy you know when i'm up here and and lemoyne a look at second base Watley's going to try to bunt him over and he's going to do it lemoyne picks it up and throws to first and oh 
Oh, I'd love to see that on a replay. I think the foot got there before the ball, but LeMoyne throws him out, runners at second and third. That's a dandy, dandy way to really put pressure on Jake LeMoyne now. A sacrifice bunt goes one to three, and back to the top of the order for Bubba Thompson. Now you've got a completely different set of problems to worry about. Bubba pushes a bunt up that first base side. I guarantee you somebody's going to score. I don't think he's going to do that, but we'll see. They've drawn it in tight to the grass all the way around. Big hole up the middle for Bubba Thompson, who has a one-for-three day going. He has stolen his 45th base. He's the official all-time stolen base leader for Round Rocks AAA. That's bunted up in the air, and the third baseman can't get to it. Strike one. No balls in one strike. And the interesting strategy, too. I mean, it's not maybe the one play I would have done, right? The infield's in, so they're all playing mm-hmm. in the grass because they don't want to let that run score. You just uh, have no have, pursuit angle as a defender. Yeah, it looked there. like he would have. It looked like he wanted to drop it down the third baseline versus pushing. Here's the 0 1 set. Lemoyne deals. That's down and away. One ball and one strike. Boy, this is a nervous time if you're Jake Lemoyne in that infield defense. And put a little load on the catcher there. Langoliers has it all out in front of him, and he can see it, but there's a huge hole up the middle. One ball and one strike. Thompson calls time. Lemoyne steps off. Cappy, what do you, what, do you, what description do you use for the sky? That I, I love it. Something. Well, there's cobalt blue. There's uh, robin's, robin's egg, egg blue. Egg. Yes, that's my favorite. The robin's This is egg. a robin's egg blue sky. Yeah. Here's the pitch. High chopper hit down towards short, and over to first got Thompson. So that's the second out now, and they got a rundown going. They're going to throw to third, and Arius is the sacrificial lamb here. And now <laughs> Doro runs back to second. Throw down there. And Arias makes a break. Now they've got him caught again. And Arias gets himself tagged out. So that brings an end to the seventh inning. No runs, one hit. And Hope went away on some base running problems here in this eighth inning. We had... To seventh inning, we head to the eighth. One to nothing, round run. So, what I want to know is what in your book will resonate with our listeners? Wow. Um, if your listeners, here's a 3 2 pitch, breaking ball down and away, ball four, a leadoff walk has put the lead, the first hitter in their lineup on, and that's the tying run on here in the eighth inning for Luis Pereira, who has a double and three times up. Put it this way, one of the parallels we try to draw in this book between baseball grinders and everybody else in the workforce, let's just, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to tell you how who in the workforce, besides just everyday people, are affected and are really grinders. That's a breaking ball, low ball, one to Barrera. If you're a single parent and you have one or two kids and you're working two jobs, you're a grinder, Okay. Just like these guys who grounded out, who would not be told, no, you're grinding it out. 1-0 instead of throw to first. Let's just say you're not at the top, not at the hierarchy of the company you work for, but you love your work, and they say, look, we need the next month you to work 60 instead of 40 hours, and you say, sign me up. You're a grinder. And we'll take it a step further. 1-0 pitch, a backdoor slider, sidearm for a strike, evens it up at 1-1. and Let's just say that you own your own small business. You have employees to worry about. You have taxes to worry about. You have employees' health to worry about. You have the government on you 99 days out of 100. That's up and away, two and one. You're a grinder. There's no doubt about it. So that affects so many of your listeners in so many ways if you just take those three and there's probably a dozen more reasons uh, why folks grind and what they grind. And the ultimate point to this, 2-1 pitch. Bouncer head out towards second. Arias throws to second, got him there. Back to first, safe at first base. So a 4-6 force puts Schumann away. Barrera's on in a fielder's choice. That'll bring up Christian Pache, who's 0 for 3. And, and the ultimate thing is, and 
Matt Cato was a grinder when he came up to the big leagues and still is. Well, if we're refusing to quit on a goal we've had, and we're going to make it happen one way or the other, we're a grinder. And I, I think sometimes people give up on themselves when they really have the ability to do something. The sting of the grind gets to them. And the next thing you know, well, uh, they've given it up, and who knows? Maybe we've lost people who could turn this world around just because they gave up because of a little pain caused by the grind of life. I don't know. But that's that's the underlying meaning to every one of these stories. Did that answer your question? I, I got on a tangent. <laughs> I just kept wandering around and hope I hit I mean, have dead you, center on some of this. Have you heard our show? It's literally off the rails. Every every episode, there. Is I think you need to call moment. it "Sisters Laugh a Lot." <laughs> <laughs> it's a. I really enjoyed being on there because I know you both very well. And here's the pitch. Uh, it breaks wide of the plate and low ball one. What's well, one another one of those, you know, lingo type of words though that I think sure. needs an explanation because I think you ask everyone, "Oh, what's a grinder?" And I don't think everyone really gets, well, what what grinding you know on the grind or grinding it out really means yeah. or is the book you know now you're you're showing them what it really One means. okay so i have to ask because movies comes up a lot in our we, we're constantly referring to sure movies favorite baseball movie the sandlot i mean not even gonna hesitate actually really? went to a, a fundraising event last night for rbi austin at the state theater one one rip foul of the third base side right next Ricochets. to the paramount um mm-hmm. where there's a showing of it awesome i mean it's crazy because the sandlot in, in these days like you don't see it you no. know like so yeah. like a kid can watch it and there's some fun it's funny and it's baseball but i mean cappy even more so than myself but yep, yep. one two uh, upstairs two balls two strikes I mean, that's what every kid did growing up it's what i did i was outside all day just like you saw so for me hands down the sandlot i can understand that i get that and i i I have two thoughts in that direction here's the two two stretch the pitch lifted into center field on the run back 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 that ball is launched it's on the roof of the home run shed the home run porch and round rock andy abanius Comes through with a big homer to give Round Rock a 2 to nothing lead. Homer for Andy, number four, RBI 17, 2 nothing E-Train. Andy Abanez take a bow. That's that big building out there that houses all the equipment that keeps this ballpark in good shape, and Andy hit it a ton. Yeah, another, another dent in the shed out there. Man, really good swing. Got it. Hit it hard. Got it up in that. A little bit of jet stream, no doubter. Steele Walker hit a home run last night. Left-handed batter, Kolarik gave up one. It was about 400 plus feet. That's up and in. Uh, I'm afraid that may have had a little intent to it. Hmm. Trying to move Walker back, huh? Steele crowds the plate. Red gloves, red sleeves, red bat, red shin guard on the right. Swing and a miss, slider away, one and one. What'd you think? You think it just got away from him? Yeah, I think so. Okay. Two thoughts, baseball movie wise. R- really, I could give you three, but I'm just going to narrow it down to two. Here's the one one. That's down and in. <clears throat> Number one, I can watch this any hour of the day or night, and it's Bull Durham, okay? It's mm, a good one. But. 1A, and it's a close 1A, and I've probably seen this movie as many times as I've seen Bull Durham. That's a bouncer hit out towards second. Scooped up. Schumann throws to first and got him. Two gone here in this inning. League of their own, and and I'll tell you why. Those ladies who played in that league at that time in U.S. history, World War II, and after, they went all the way to 1954, really were trendsetters and and way out ahead of their time. And the fact that they did that and succeeded and drew crowds, and that's remarkable when you think about it. 
Great, great call, great pick. Mm-hmm. That's probably going to be mine. Here's Sam Huff. Please hit it out of the ball. Why did you used to cry at baseball games and then? No, now I you don't <laughs> because you've seen that movie. <laughs> no, she's crying, sir. Uh, what what is uh, what's the kid's name? Um, Stillwell Angel. Stillwell Angel. Still well. uh, here's a candy bar. Classic. The Sultan of Swat. The King of Crash. The Colossus of Clout. The Colossus of Clout. The Sultan of Swat. The King of Crash. The Colossus of Clout. The Colossus of Clout. Okay, so that was the interview that I did with Cappy interview slash play calling slash um, learning new things slash interrupting him when he's talking. (laughs) He's like, hold on a second. It just it gives you a new level of appreciation for how hard it is to be a baseball person talking about baseball during the game because you have to pay attention, be able to explain exactly what's happening. It was a really good experience. Um, again, thank you to Cappy. Thank you to Matt Kata for being willing to share your microphone time with me. And I had a great time and I hope you guys enjoy listening. Thank you. For doing that. Thank you for setting all that up. Thank Big you to fun. the Round Rock Express for sharing mm-hmm. us. And Absolutely. Thank you to all of our listeners for rating and reviewing <laughs> and subscribing <sighs> and doing all the things that you're supposed to do so that we can be found in all the places by all the people. Do those things because we need followers. So go find us on Twitter. <laughs> right? If I'm going to hook up and get free HelloFresh right. or maybe a code for y'all. Ooh, that would be good. What should the code be? Yeah, barley. barley barley code promo code barley <laughs> oh by the way happy late birthday to our friend jordan whose birthday is on mean girls happy day jordan. october 3rd <laughs> love you jordan right. so um oh. i have to say make good choices mm-hmm. and i'm gonna say barley is a carb and use your gift cards okay bye Hey friends, thanks for listening to the CK and GK podcast. Find us at CK and GK podcast on Instagram and Twitter and rate, review, and subscribe on Apple podcasts, Spotify, good pods, or anywhere else that you pod. See you next time.